welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Jerome Dorfman, Associate Professor of Law at Syracuse University College of Law. We will discuss his article, Suspicious Species, which will be published in the University of Illinois Law Review. So welcome back to the show, Jerome. Hi, Brian. Thank you for having me again. Oh, it's my pleasure. I always love talking about your work with you. I think it's really important and timely, and I love the empirical work that you've been so elegantly folding in to all of these pieces. Thank you very, very much. Um, well, so for this particular article, I was wondering if you could start by sort of describing the nature of the problem that you're identifying and analyzing in this paper. So specifically, you talk about something that you refer to as the quote unquote disability con in relation to specifically uh, the use of service animals uh, by disabled people and you know how those service animals are treated in terms of disability accommodations. So maybe you could kind of, kind of flesh out the nature of the problem for us. Sure. So I'll take you back to 2014 when I was a young doctoral student at Stanford, and I decided to write my dissertation on this phenomenon that I coined the disability con, um, this idea that um, there is a perception that people take advantage of disability law and disability accommodations, and um, they basically abuse the law, misuse it to get an unfair advantage in all types of situations in everyday life. So my previous work um, has dealt with disability con as a framework and also with specific um, examples to situations where there is a scarcity of resource. So the scarcity of resource can be um, you know, par in, in parking situations, it can be in lines. And, and by the way, it actually became very, very timely with COVID-19 and the medical rationing debate that a lot of people has talked about. So that tag, that took a little bit of, um, you know, an unbelievable, a little bit sad turn recently. Um, so yeah, so basically I deal with this perception that people um, are abusing the law, abusing disability rights and faking disability basically in order to get an unfair advantage. And when I was a doctoral student um, right at the beginning, I went to this big conference and I told someone about my research and they said, oh, you have to write about dogs. You have to write about it, and you have to write about it now. This was like five years ago, right? And I was like, oh, no, I really do need to write about this idea that, you know, people encounter um, dog um, and other animals now in multiple public spaces, whether it's on airplanes, whether it's in restaurants, whether it's in shops. You know, the people just encounter those everywhere now, and people tell them, well, you know, this is my assistance animal or service animal. Assistance animal is more of an umbrella term, I'll explain later. Um, this is my service dog, or this is my uh, service, you know, animal. And people also encounter dogs, but they also read a lot of, you know, news articles and media coverage of all those what I call suspicious species rounding around, uh, wrecking havoc, in our um, public spaces. So in 2014, there was a really famous article in the New Yorker by Patricia Marks, it's called Pets Allowed, where the um, journalist went equipped with a letter she received from a healthcare professional. She traveled all around New York City with different exotic animals. So she had an alpaca, a turkey, a snake, um, a pig. And they went all over. They went to the mat. They went to the uh, to the subway. And she just went everywhere. And she said, well, this is my emotional support pig. Well, this is my emotional support alpaca. You need to accommodate me. And people thought to themselves, wow, is that really true? Can people really do that? Or does people just want to troll us, right? Or do people just want to take, you know, their pets everywhere, even where pets are not allowed? And some people might remember Dexter the Peacock. Um, that went all over national news about this woman who took her peacock to the airport and tried to board the United flight, and United didn't allow her to do that. And people started saying, well, this is absurd. You know, people are abusing disability laws, and people are trying to take their pets everywhere. We don't believe that there's such a thing as a service animal. How can a turkey or how can, like, a, a, a peacock 
you know, help a person. And there's a big misinformation that comes around with regard to assistance animals in general, the different category of assistance animals. And that, I think, creates a big confusion and a big misunderstanding about what is disability law with regard to service dogs, uh, service animals, and assistance uh, and other type of assistance animals, so, uh, kind of like um, emotional support uh, animals as well. Mm. Well, so one thing I learned from your article that I was really unaware of before reading it is that there's a much broader kind of range of different ways in which animals are used as a form of accommodation or kind of are relevant to accommodations in a disability context. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about sort of that taxonomy of kind of different legal statuses of animals in relation to disability law, sort of what different ways they're used, what's required to qualify for each one of those categories, and maybe how the law treats animals that fall into those categories differently. Yeah, for sure. So I think that's a really important point, and that's how I start my uh, my piece. So you can think about different types of assistance animals according to their rationale or the job, the role they play in the lives of people with disabilities. So with service animals, the law really emphasizes the functionality of the animal to the disabled individual over the emotional component of the relationship between those two, the animal and the uh, person with a disability. So service animals can only be dogs or miniature horses. And they need to be trained specifically to perform tasks for their handlers. Their handlers are people with disabilities. Um, so there's basically two requirements. One, that it's a dog or a, a miniature horse in a few situations, and that they are trained to perform specific tasks. Um, and those are regulated by the um, ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, which regulates public spaces and public spheres and also the workplace. And basically their definition appears in the ADA Title II and Title III regulations which um, relate to places of accommodations or um, to places or uh, federally governed if, uh, institutions or federally funded, sorry, institutions. Um, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, it also governs federally funded institutions, which is a precursor to the ADA, also covers service animals. And service animals are allowed to go everywhere in public space, um, meaning they are, uh, are allowed to go in into stores with their handlers. They're allowed to go on airplanes. They're allowed to go basically everywhere because they perform specific tasks for their handlers. Now, those specific tasks can vary. They can be, you know, we all think about as service dogs, we all think about probably, you know, a guide dog, right? That helps a person who is blind, you know, to cross the road or to navigate public spaces. But actually service dogs perform multiple functions. So they can alert people with, chronic conditions with allergies, they can alert them to um, something that is, you know, in the air or something that can bother them. They can also, um, you know, relieve stress from people. So this is also for people who have some kind of an, a, a mental disability. They can actually relieve them if they have a men if they're going to have a breakdown, they can alert them to that. If they're going to have PTSD, they can alert them to episodes of PTSD. So basically, they do a lot of stuff, but specific tasks that are aimed to relieve and help people with disabilities live their lives. So these are service animals. And as I say, the functionality of them that kind of is, you know, akin to this idea of assistive equipment is what's emphasized by the law. However, we have an, another type of um, assistance uh, animal, which are emotional support animals. Here, the law does not really look at the functionality per se to the human, but also to the, but mostly or only to the component in the relationship that is a, a, an emotional component. An emotional support animal provides companionship, it relieves loneliness, it sometimes helps with certain phobias and anxieties, but it is not trained to perform tasks to assist people with disabilities per se. Basically, 
An emotional support animal is a pet. Everybody who has a pet can tell me that their pet is actually pro- fulfilling all this idea about all their emotional needs in a relationship between man and animal. That's why those specific animals, those uh, type of assistance animals, are much more restricted. And they're only governed by two federal statutes. One is the Fair Housing Act, and the other is the Air Carrier Access Act. Meaning, emotional support animals can only be found in a house, in, in housing, in the housing context, or on airplanes, on aircraft. What also uh, differentiates um, um, emotional support animals from service animals is that emotional support animals can be any type of species, any type of animal. It can go from you know, a ferret to a turkey to a horse. Um, and those basically you know, are all pets that can be um, used as an emotional support animals. However, they are much more restricted than that. Um, as I said, in the Federal Housing Act, um, which is um, enforced by the DOJ and the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, basically there is this idea that if a person has an emotional support animal and he has some kind of a documentation to show that that uh, animal helps a person with a disability relieve, you know, stress and it, it you know, gets him some companionship and fulfill some kind of an emotional need for them, then the no pets allowed policy can be relieved for that person. In an airplane with the Air Carrier Access Act, it was enacted in 1986 to respond to a Supreme Court decision that um, decided that Section 504 for the Rehabilitation Act does not apply to commercial airlines, despite the fact they're getting governmental subsidies. Those were, you know, protecting people with disabilities who might need emotional support animals. However, there are some restrictions on that, and a person needs documentation to show that uh, uh, he needs an emotional support animal, and the airlines can actually refuse to get um, on board an animal who is exo- which is exotic, right? So a reptile, a ferret, a rodent, or something like that. So those basically are the two main um, categories of um, assistance animals. There is one more category of therapy animals, that is different. Therapy animals are the kind that use that are only used in hospitals and nursing home visitation uh, for you know an animal assisted therapy. They're being um, trained and overseen by a nonprofit organization called Pets Partners that is formerly known as Delta Society. They're a different breed and they actually are not governed by any disability law per se. Mm-hmm. Well, so in your in your paper, you provided information based both on qualitative and on quantitative studies. And and I have to say, I found a lot of the qualitative uh, information really interesting and helpfully context providing in understanding how this kind of increasing public perception, for better or for worse, or for true or for false, of a disability con affects the ability of disabled people to use service animals primarily and also emotional support animals in a way that's consistent with the kinds of accommodations that they're entitled to. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you learned from your research in that front, sort of the nature of the research you did and sort of what kind of findings you had. Yeah. um, So I'm an empirical researcher, but I think of myself as someone who uh, bridges to, you know, I don't know, to camps, I guess, in legal scholarship and I think um, social science scholarship. So, you know, you have those law and economics people who really don't look at your paper unless you have a few regression tables in it, right? And a few graphs in it. So I would like to think that a person who does law and economics, you would look at my paper and would appreciate, um, you know, so, um, some quantitative research that I do and the quality of it, the quality of the analysis and the statistical um, analysis that I conduct in my research, and also the representative um, samples that I use are usually representative of the population. So there is um, also something to talk about that. Um, and I hope people who do quantitative research appreciate that. But then I really think that um, as a law psychology type of person, because I consider myself a law psychology researcher, I really look, I'm really interested in processes 
and to look how people, you know, experience things. And in order to really learn or study processes, you can't really quantify it by numbers all the time. So you really need more to talk with people. And, I'm a, and, and that's something that I really enjoy doing, I think. And, and that's why my research, you know, encompasses both aspects. It encompasses, you know, the slow and economics type of analysis, more quantitative one. And then it also incorporates, you know, qualitative research. And I think that gives what you said. It gives context, but it also gives, I think, meaning and, un- and bigger understanding of what is going on, how the law is really enacting, uh, is un- enacted on the ground. And what I found from my um, qualitative research is that there is a disability hierarchy. Now, the disability hierarchy exists in many areas of the law. And uh, I write about it in my scholarship. And Professor Jasmine Harris from Davis also writes about this. And that hierarchy relates a lot to visibility of the disability. And people with invisible disabilities or less apparent disabilities tend to suffer more from suspicion of disability con, although people with visible disabilities also suffer from suspicion, it seems to manifest in a different way with people with um, mental illness, for example. So in my qualitative um, analysis, I bring, I amplify voices of people who have gone through PTSD episodes, who have gone through all kinds of mental illness uh, uh, issues and, disab- and, and who have mental disabilities and how they use their um, service dog in order to help them deal with this. And this is a service dog. It's not an emotional support animal. To, um, and they're, they're getting all those reactions from society that actually really em- em- emphasize, emphasizes how disability is socially constructed, how disability is a process between the Uh, It's an interactive process between the impairment, the pathology, and our society. Basically, those people are suffering from harassment all the time. Every time they need to go out with their service dog, right? Because people think of them them as people who are abusing the system. So that's more of my qualitative uh, uh, type of analysis that I've done. It is something that I don't think you can actually quantify from a quantitative analysis. What I did with my quantitative analysis is I did two things. I, first of all, ran an experiment on how uh, people with disabilities really deal with this uh, uh, fear of them abusing the system and how they're signaling their compliance with the law using visible signs of compliance. Now, those visible signs of compliance are extra legal norms. One of them is the type of the dog they're using. And here there's also type of like interesting phenomenon going on. So we are used to think about service dogs being Labradors, uh, German Shepherds, Golden Retrievers, those big dogs, right? And when we see, you know, a Paris Hilton type of dog, right? Well, I I just, you know, I don't know if uh, my students know who Paris Hilton is anymore, but, you know, those little chihuahuas or little small dogs um, that, you know, purse dogs that you carry around, people think of those as, you know, just pets. However, small dogs can be service dogs and they can, you know, perform really essential um, services for people with disabilities because they, they are more mobile and they also can reach uh, the person's face and maybe lick their face and create, you know, and help them, you know, be alert to issues. I had um, an interviewer who had sleep apnea. So sleep apnea is a condition when you stop breathing, when you are sleeping, and she needed a small dog to be able to crawl up in bed and wake her up when she has an episode. Um, so in my uh, uh, experiment that I ran, one um, visible sign of compliance is the type of the dog. Is it a small dog or is it a big dog? And the other type of visible sign of compliance is those special gear that people put on their dogs, whether it's a vest, whether it's a tag, whether it's a harness, whether it's an ID. Um, those are really interesting because the ADA does not require a person to signal that they are carrying a service dog with them using those um, types of gears. However, because of the suspicion, there, there's been like a cottage industry around those um, vests 
and those IDs and furnaces and tags. And this is really flourishing. And if you every and, and everyone who can hear us can go on Amazon and readily buy, you know, a vest for their dog. So I was really interested about, you know, this aspect of what people find, what other people find to be a more trustworthy, visible sign of compliance. So I basically um, ran an experiment. It's a simple two by two experiment where I um, took four photos of the same person um, sitting in a restaurant with a dog. One time it's a small dog, one time it's a big dog, right? So that's one visible sign of compliance, one of the independent variable. And the other time that dog wears a vest or doesn't wear a vest. And I actually copied this idea from a real life Yelp review for a restaurant in San Diego where a person were actually, uh, someone actually uploaded a picture from a restaurant saying, oh, this guy, this person is really, you know, taking advantage of the system. I'm sure um, this is not a service dog. And the um, vest that they bought online doesn't mean anything to me. So basically, when I showed it to a, a, a representative sample of over 1,000 people in the population, um, do, uh, it, was, it was conducted online. I was really interested to see what influences people's suspicion or what influences people's perception of the legitimacy or the legality of the use of a service dog. And what I found out is that both independent variables, meaning both the, the, the vest and the breed of the dog, both have a statistically significant effect on the level of suspicion about whether this is a, a disability con or a legitimate use of a dog. However, the vest condition, whether a dog is wearing a vest or not, has a much larger effect on the level of suspicion about disability con. So that was, you know, something to think about and also, also leads to me to, you know, recommend some policy recommendations regarding having a, a unified system that, you know, identifies real service dogs and, you know, not, and other pets and it really gives specific signs of compliance that are regulated by the state. Now, this type of a mechanism needs to be very sensitive to privacy issues. It also needs to be sensitive to cost issues for people with disabilities. And I discuss all of those caveats in my um, paper. Um, but I do think that it also needs to be done in a way that does not allow people to be able to purchase vests, IDs, harnesses online. It those should be distributed by the different states, um, something kind of like a driver's license, in my opinion, or a, a, or a license plate or something like that. Again, this is a more complicated issue, but I do think, you know, putting in place those caveats that I mentioned and making sure people with disabilities are not being hurt will actually do more good than harm. So that's the first um, idea about quantitative analysis in this paper, but I wanted to take it a step further, and I wanted to see how the law itself reacts to those non-legal norms, and that's where I actually do some kind of content analysis of state statutes regarding assistance animals. I'll be happy to talk about that as well if you want me to, or maybe you have another question. Oh, sure, of course. Why don't you follow up with the other study as well and talk about what you found there? Yeah, so what is really interesting is that with this, you know, perception of disability con, this idea that a lot of people are actually abusing the system, um, the legal system actually reacts to these ideas really rather quickly, I would say. And what I did is I um, surveyed the state statute that, regulates an, an assistance animals in some way. And, and I'll talk about what I found in a minute, but what I want to show is that it actually connects to a really important theory in law and society research. Um, it's a theory that was um, um, developed by Lauren Edelman of UC Berkeley. She famously argued in the 1990s and late 80s that ambiguous and complex laws that have a relatively weak enforcement mechanism in place put in motion a process of constructing signs of compliance and legitimacy that do not appear in formal law, but are exercised by, by legal actors. And she demonstrated it 
by an example of Title VII to the Civil Rights Act, the the anti-discrimination laws with regard to employment discrimination. And she shows how and organizations and, you know, employers institutionalize affirmative action offices, organized workshops, and a set of internal policies to deal with Title VII, to, to show that they are actually in compliance with Title VII to the Civil Rights Act, that they're, not, they're practicing anti-discrimination policies in their workplace. And But what's interesting is none of those um, steps were included in black letter law. They were used uh, to show something, but there were extra legal signs of compliance. Well, that sounds familiar, right? To what happened, what I explained with what's going on with vests and types of dogs, right? So Edelman's accounts of informal signs of compliance indicate how those informal signs of compliance are being reinforced by legal institutions like the courts, and they actually are adopted into the law. She showed how courts treated the institutionalization of affirmative action practices as evidence of compliance in good faith with Title VII, despite those were not even required by the law in the first place. So now when I went and I looked at the um, laws that regulate assistance animals, I I didn't only look at how many states are actually having now you know, laws that regulate assistance animals, and I can tell you that 42 have those. I looked at how does those visible signs of compliance regarding maybe breeds of dogs or regarding vests or other types of gears, how how are those implemented or do they actually being implemented into the law? And what I found is that 15 states have adopted into the law a specific prohibition about the use of vests or collars or tags or harnesses on dogs that are not service dogs, meaning those states say you are not allowed to use any type of gear in order to conduct a disability con, in order to misrepresent your pet as a service dog. And this led me to a conclusion that formal law has adopted, at least to some effect, what used to be informal visible signs of compliance. However, contrary to what Edelman, Lauren Edelman says in her original theory, the adoption under those circumstances was signs of non-compliance, right? So now the laws are saying um, if you are using those type of gear, you are not acting in good faith. You are alerting others to the potential misleading use, use of this law. So I thought this was really advancing theory in law and society further. And I was very happy that, you know, to Lauren Edelman, to be honest, I'll be very, she was one of my mentors and I really appreciate and love her scholarship. So I was very happy that I could engage in it in such a meaningful way and hopefully take it a step forward too. Mm -hmm. Well, in relation to that observation you just made, I mean, it seemed like the paper observed that the disability con problem was in some respects a bigger one in this context than in other aspects of disability law. In other words, people were taking advantage of the law when they weren't entitled to more frequently than they would in other other contexts. And I wonder, you know, why do you think that is, right? Why are people inclined to make spurious claims for an animal to be a service animal more so than they are, say, to like, you know, use a handicapped parking space when they're not entitled to use it? And are there ways that we could discourage people from abusing the law when they're not entitled to this sort of accommodation, especially insofar as, you know, there are sort of indirect harms to disabled people who, as a consequence, are burdened in their ability to use those accommodations? Yeah, thank you for that question. That actually is a huge question. So remember, I started this our conversation by telling you about this woman at this conference telling me, well, you have to write about the dogs immediately, right? Like that was five years ago. And I was very reluctant to do that because I noticed that as you said, there is a distinction between what I call assistance animal disability con and other types of disability con. And I think with other types of disability con, for example, parking in, in a disabled parking spot 
or you know even asking for learning accommodations in college or in an educational setting when you don't don't deserve those or you know whatever people are not taking pride in doing that people you know feel a little bit of a shame that Of doing that there's actually research about people who park in disabled parking and how they feel about it there's my research on it and there's other research done on it and it seems that people are more reluctant to mention that nobody will come to you and will say you know what you know what I did today I just went and I parked in a disabled parking spot in front of that store or I uh, you know got social security benefits although I don't deserve those people not are not really you know inclined to say that but with the Assistant animals disability con with misrepresenting their pet as a service dog, people are actually taking pride in this. People are actually, you know, really, you know, freely talk about it. And when I talked with my interviewees, all of them are people with disabilities, a lot of them actually had family members who do it. And they were like, you know, a little bit like embarrassed to say, but they know a lot of people who actually do it. And I started thinking to myself, what might explain the difference in people's attitude What is the psychological mechanism that helps people, you know, overcome the, this shame or, you know, overcome this idea that they might not do something illegal? And then I encountered um, another really incredible book that I would like to recommend. It's Yuval Feldman's book, um, The Law of Good People, which talks a lot about, you know, what makes people react to the law, even good people, even if, even if they don't think that. They want to harm others it's a really important book i think in line psychology one of the uh, better ones i've read in recent years so yuval feldman talks a lot about a uh, multiple bear uh, a psych- psychological mechanisms but specifically what caught me was this idea about bounded ethicality so bounded ethicality is a cognitive process that leads people to overestimate their own abilities to remain impartial and to ass- assess the nature and consequences of their action So this idea is really limiting, you know, about it, and ethicality really limits people's recognition of conflicts of interest between their own self-interest and others' welfare, which leads them to believe that they're actually acting more ethically than what they really are. And here, what, and here I think that's what's going on with Disability Con, uh, with, with this idea about assistance animals, Disability Con. It seems that... Um, People who engage in a misrepresentation of their pets as assistance animals, they don't see a victim. They don't identify victims who suffer the consequences of their acts. As opposed to other situations where people, you know, go in front of lines um, or take a parking spot, here there is a distance kept between the disabled person, the disabled victim, one in... A person doesn't really see that he takes any resource directly from people with disabilities. People actually see themselves differently. They don't see themselves hurting people with disabilities. Who they think they hurt is actually pe- the deep-pocketed entities, such as airlines, housing management companies, or business owners. People think of themselves as sticking it to the men. They don't see themselves as actually hurting people with disabilities, you know, and they don't see the effect that is created on people with disabilities. And I think that's what distinguishes um, assistance animals disability con and uh, other types of disability con. Where, uh, you know, we, in my research, there's always this tension about how much abuse there really is on the ground. And I do give some statistics on that in other papers of mine. Um, however, I'm more interested in the perception, but this gap between the perceptions and reality is something that I constantly grapple with. And I think in this paper, it was very clear to me that even people, and I'll be very honest, I even know law professors who misrepresent their uh, 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 pets as service animals. I also know law professors who use legitimate uh, service dogs and emotional support animals. I, I know people on both fronts, but I think the first ones, Who might not be even aware that they're doing something wrong, this idea about bounded ethicality is really what prevents them from seeing um, that what they're doing is against the law and it's also non-ethical. So another policy recommendation that I uh, recommend in my paper is to use what, I, what is known in the literature as ethical nudges. 
right? So they, these are, and every I think a lot of our few, uh, listeners are familiar with this idea about nudges. Those are designed to raise awareness, promote ethical reflection, and ultimately they, to change behavior, to alter behavior. Um, and they need to come in real time at crucial juncture of the possibility of committing an unethical or an un, or illegal act. And they need to uh, be something that is not seen routinely by people. So you can think about, you know, I think this is a point that needs to be further developed. And we need, really need to think about how do we employ ethical nudges with uh, the use of assistance animals. And I give a few examples. So I can really envision a, a situation where you um, order your plane ticket or online or when you get your ticket uh, via email and you mark that you are going to um, bring an animal on board. Maybe on that situation, there's going to be a picture on the screen or a little text showing you, you know, how your act, how misrepresenting a, a service dog or misrepresenting an assistant, a, a pet as an assistance animal, how does that affect people with disabilities? How does that really delegitimize, delegitimize the uh, use of the law by people who actually need those a, a accommodation. So that's like one example. You can think about it maybe when you buy, you know, a, a, a train ticket, maybe when you buy a, 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 or you do a reservation for a restaurant or something like that. I think, you know, those interesting and creative ways of alerting people to um, the consequences of their act and also illuminating the victim who are people with disabilities in those situations and show how people with disabilities are being hurt by your actions, I think that's another way of dealing with this idea about bonded ethicality. Um, mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, so, Daron, in, in closing, one thing that I thought was really interesting about your paper as well were some suggestions you made about how people including like businesses, but I don't think it's maybe just limited to businesses, could ask questions about a, uh, a, rep, a person representing a service dog or a support animal in such a way as to not embarrass or shame someone who is disabled and who has a need for that animal, but also to convey to someone who's making that claim inappropriately that, you know, what they're doing is not, not correct and that they should stop doing that. And I wonder if you could just talk about that a little bit, because it struck me as like a really kind of interesting and sort of practical application of some of the ideas you talk about in your paper. Yeah. Um, so another, um, I think, policy recommendation or another implication from this paper is the really uh, this idea about enforcement or, of the rules by gatekeepers of public accommodations. Um, now, what's really interesting about disability law and what I think allows me to do a lot of my work around public perceptions and public attitudes um, about, around disability law is that disability law is dependent on private enforcement. Um, we are in charge of enforcing disability laws in our lives, right? So whether it's a, a security guard who wouldn't allow a person with a dog to enter a, a facility, or whether it's someone in administration at a university approving learning accommodations to a student, or whether it's a, a, a guest at Disneyland, right, who would allow a person to go to the disabled line and a, a get to the attraction first, right? So it's actually really dependent on private enforcement. So this enforcement of the rules is something that came up a lot in my um, interviews with people with disabilities, and they were complaining that um, shop owners and people in public spaces really never enforce those rules against fakers, against people who might be abusing those, those rules. Um, and they call for a better articulation of the rules to those um, people in who are gatekeepers of public accommodations. I understand that this is also, you know, a little bit complicated because you can think about minimum wage workers, you know, that do not need me to tell them how to do their job, right? But I think it's something that needs to be more implemented in, in you know, the um, this area, in, in the way people actually execute their jobs 
in public places. Now, what you are learning to is also this idea about privacy. So basically, the uh, ADA regulations do not allow a person to ask a person with a disability about their disabilities. Um, and that's a privacy concern. You know, privacy is such, a, a, is such an important norm and such an important value in American society. And that's why the ADA um, regulation actually allow for very, very specific questions to be asked. You can ask, is this a, a service dog? And what are, the, um, what are the functions that the dogs do for you? What does the dog do for you? And these are uh, um, situations where you actually can easily differentiate between a service dog who can go inside those public accommodations and an emotional support animal who cannot. Because if a person tells you, well, this dog does not, you know, he, he, he doesn't perform anything for me, well, that means it shouldn't come into the store. But if a person tells, tells you, oh, you know, this dog actually, you know, helps calm my uh, nerves, it's, it's actually he's trained to do that, I, uh, um, or he actually fetches things for me, or he helps me navigate public spaces, things like that. He helps me maybe deal with my allergies, uh, my panic attacks, things like that. If it's trained to do that, then you'll know it's a service uh, dog and it can actually be allowed to enter the store. So that actually, you know, is a really interesting and I think smart way to deal with those situations. It still keeps this value of privacy, which I think is an important one, while also differentiating between service dogs and other emotional support animals. Mm. Well, Daron, thanks so much for coming on the show. Uh, as always, uh, the paper is fantastic. There's a lot of great uh, information and insight in it. And I, I recommend to interested listeners, they check out the paper as a whole, because we only touched on parts of, of your argument. Um, but, uh, you know, I learned a lot reading it and it really helped me better contextualize, you know, what was going on in this area of law that I didn't really know anything about. Thank you so much, Brian. The paper is available on SSRN, and I welcome comments. It's going to come out in 2021, and I just want to say one last thing about it. I'm very happy that it comes and is coming out in Illinois Law Review, not only because I think it's a great journal, but also because Illinois is a state that has not yet regulated assistance animals, unlike other states, and hopefully this paper would lead to real legal change in the, in the way this phenomenon is being regulated. Well, I certainly hope so. Thanks a lot, Drone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Wow.
though I'm just a small fry who thinks I'm a whale. My little pup wins a fat leather nose and a winkling, waggling, winkling, waggling. My little pup wins a fat leather nose and a winkling, waggling tail. <laughs> 